when the headline says the United Nations Human Rights Council said, people imagine a decision of uh, Socrates, Aristotle, or Plato, when in fact, those sitting around the table are historically Gaddafi, Castro, and the House of Saud <laughs> sitting around the Human Rights Council. Shalom and welcome to State of a Nation. I'm Elon Levy. Bias, bigotry, and bullying. It's long been known that the United Nations is institutionally weighted against Israel. That bias is cemented so deeply it's practically part of the architecture. From UNHQ in Turtle Bay, New York, all the way to UNRWA HQ in Gaza City, which supplied electricity to the Hamas server farm in the basement. After the October 7 massacre, Israel could have expected the UN to condemn the Hamas atrocities, demand Hamas's surrender, and stand by Israel's side. Instead, it faced silence about the atrocities. No UN Secretary General in history, I said in a press conference, has ever done more than Antonio Guterres to secure the survival of a terrorist organization. And maybe that's because the UN doesn't even consider Hamas a terrorist organization. Here's what the UN Relief Chief Martin Griffith said on Sky News recently. I've worked with many, many, many different terrorist and, and, and insurgent groups. Uh, Hamas is not a terrorist group for, for us, of course, as you know, it's a political movement. I was waiting to go on air straight after him and I was shocked. So I cut and tweeted the clip. It caused a firestorm. By the afternoon, Griffiths had to put out a clarification saying he meant Hamas simply wasn't on the UN's official list of terror groups. Germany's foreign minister threw him serious shade, tweeting back that Hamas is actually on the EU's list of terror groups. And the scandal went all the way to the White House and a John Kirby presser. Right. Hamas is a terrorist organization. We've said so. It is. It just is. And you don't have to look any further than what they did on the 7th of October to see it in stark terms. And my goodness, take a look at their manifesto, even the one that's so-called watered down in 2017. There's no doubt. They just want to wipe Israel off the face of the map. This is a terrorist organization, pure and simple, period. It's not just Martin Griffiths. The UN's top officials have been covering up how Hamas terrorists infiltrated UNRWA. They've been pretending that Hamas isn't waging war out of hospitals. They've been denying the blatantly anti-Semitic nature of the massacre, spreading lies, actual lies, about Israel and its conduct in this war, all the while good people around the world look up to the United Nations for moral authority. And that's why I wanted to sit down with Hillel Neuer, who's been calling out these officials and agencies for years. Hillel is the executive director of UN Watch, an independent watchdog that has been investigating the anti-Israel rot at the United Nations. In a world of despots and dictators, is it still possible to get the United Nations to live up to the lofty values it set itself back in 1945. Join me and Hillel Neuer here at the State of a Nation podcast for some untold, unfathomable, and unvarnished truths. Breaking news out of Israel this morning. Shocking hostage taking. Hundreds of Israelis are dead. I want to bring in Israeli government spokesman. What happens when a four-day course? How do you resolve this? Where does this go? You can't do this. Hillel Neuer, welcome to the State of a Nation podcast. Thank you for having me. Have I ever told you you're my hero? Uh, no, first time. So you're my hero. Thank you. You've done a terrific job in standing up to bullies, speaking truth to power, standing up as the little guy on the big uh, stage of the United Nations, and we'll watch a couple of the clips that you've made, and really telling them the truth to their faces. Thank you. One of the things that's really been bothering me in the course of this war is seeing some of the really vile opinions and behavior coming out of the United Nations. We just, uh, we're recording this podcast after Israel announced that it would deny entry to Francesca Albanese, who is the UN Special Rapporteur for Occupied Palestinian Territories, after she denied the anti-Semitic character of the October 7 massacre, uh, claimed it was some act of resistance to Israeli oppression. And I wonder how does the UN get filled with so many people with such rep impulsive opinions. They have to get appointed. And uh, in the case of Albanese is a good example. She was appointed by the president of the Human Rights Council with the approval of all 47 members, including many democracies. I'm not going to name them today, but I may name them soon on Twitter. Stay tuned. Um, and, it, you know, we told them 
her, she was a known case. The fact that she's comparing Israelis to Nazis. This was known before she was appointed. This was known before she was appointed. We, we published a dossier on her. The fact that she was virulently, not just anti-Israel, but anti-Semitic, comparing the plight of the Palestinians to the n victims of the Nazis. She's been engaging some really horrific Holocaust inversion as well during this war. During this war, but again, yeah, before she was appointed. So we, we told the UN, we published a dossier. Uh, it was called Mandate to Discriminate. We wrote a report about uh, the position she had on the different candidates. The world knew exactly who she was. The Palestinians knew who she was. That's why they wanted her. That's why the Arab and Islamic states wanted mm. her. And enough other countries joined in in appointing her. You're saying it's not a fault in the system. It's not, it's not a bug in the it's system. It's a feature. It's a feature. It's a feature. And certainly in her case, yes. So look, what I want to do today is talk to you about that feature, how it is that this anti-Israel bias has become so deeply ingrained at the United Nations, the level that it is institutional. It's not systemic rot. It, the, the system is the rot. Try to understand how we got here. Try to understand how we deal with it. Because I find as a government spokesman, one of the biggest challenges is waking up every morning and essentially declaring war on the whole world. Because in order to make the case for Israel, I have not only Hamas and the Palestinians telling me that I'm a liar, I have all the United Nations agencies that have been covering up for Hamas saying the same, and a whole alphabet soup of human rights organizations also echoing their message. And they all seem to have been completely mobilized against Israel in this war, running interference for Hamas, essentially. Yes, it's true. I mean, certainly the UN does uh, produce a disproportionately anti-Israel outcome, even if several countries that belong to the UN may not be that hostile, but the net result, because in part of 56 Islamic states who historically didn't have much to unite them, you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia, for example, are historic rivals. But the thing that unites them when the Islamic group meets is the struggle against Israel, historically. Of course, now we're at a time when the Gulf Arab states are looking towards peace with Israel and the Abraham Accords. But putting that aside, up until a few years ago, when the Islamic countries would meet to talk about the organization of Islamic countries, the, the sole unifier, the common denominator, was Jerusalem and Israel. That's the only thing that really united them. Or, you know, they would also accuse the West of Islamophobia. That became an add-on around the time of 9-11. So the Islamic countries with 56 states at the UN, you know, if you're a country that doesn't have a dog in this fight, you're a country that doesn't necessarily hate Jews or Israel, but there are 56 Islamic states telling you, if you don't vote for our resolutions against Israel, our commission of inquiry against Israel, our special rapporteur, Francesca Albanese, we will punish you. And if you're a small country or a large country, they could punish your country in not getting investments. Qatar may invest billions or not, depending on how you vote. But as an individual ambassador, maybe you'll get appointed to some high UN position, which many aspire to in New York or Geneva, or you won't get it because you angered the Arab group of 22 countries and the Islamic group of 56 countries. That is a big role in what happens at the UN. Because 56 countries is more than a quarter yes. of the entire UN membership. And sometimes I think people have a habit of looking at the United Nations, treating it with a great degree of reverence as if it is this independent institution that has sworn an oath to the sacred UN Charter, when in fact it is essentially the sum of its parts. And those parts are not particularly liberal and not particularly democratic. That's right. I think certainly in Europe and many other countries, I grew up in Canada, when the headline says the United Nations Human Rights Council said, people imagine, and the Lord said to Moses at Sinai, they imagine <laughs> men in long white beards dressed in white robes strolling along Mount Olympus, making their decisions based on facts, logic, or morality. And I what, find that so often being interviewed where the interviewer will say, the, according to the United Nations or the UN Special Rapporteur, and it just has this halo of sanctity around it that Absolutely. you cannot touch it. There's this impression that it's, you know, there's a decision of uh, Socrates, Aristotle, or Plato, when in fact, those sitting around the table are historically Gaddafi, Castro, and the House of Saud <laughs> sitting around the Human Rights Council. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's slaughter that sacred cow and have a look at what the United Nations really is as an institution removed from the very lofty and noble values that were supposed to have led it uh, into an institution that has would it be fair to say, I mean, essentially hijacked by non-democratic states? Yes. The Human Rights Council is now 60% full-on tyrannies or other non-democracies. And the Qatar, Human Rights China. Council ha condemns Israel with a frequency of... Of, uh, you know, more than any other country in the world. More condemnations, combined. More condemnations against Israel, certainly than Iran, Syria, North Korea combined. Uh, there's one agenda item on the, 
the whole world at each session and one agenda item on Israel alone. No other country, not Russia and Ukraine, not North Korea, not Syria has its own agenda item, only Israel. Truly astonishing. So we're talking about an institution that has this deeply embedded institutional bias and obsessive focus against Israel because that is what helps all the Islamic countries mobilize together for collective action. It's the one thing but they can not only, on. But not only, you know, I don't want to give a free pass to the European countries, for example, and many others. You know, the Islamic and Arab countries lead the resolutions, but they are automatically joined by all the other dictatorships that are not Islamic. Russia joins them, Cuba joins them, North Korea joins them, that's for sure. But in many cases, sadly, even our own democracies... Abstain. Uh, no. In, in New York City at the General Assembly, the EU countries and the UK too will typically support two-thirds of the resolutions against Israel. They will vote yes. Why? If you ask them, if you ask them, they will say, well, uh, it's a resolution condemning Israel for violations of international law, and that's our position, and we support that. And if you say, well, okay, I understand your position, but, you know, there's one resolution on Iran and 15 on Israel. You support 10 of those. Why would you support 10 resolutions against Israel? Isn't it obsessive? and counterproductive for the UN. How do they respond when you raise that criticism with them? They uh, try to avoid the topic. They'll sometimes say, well, you know, Israel has occupation. And they say, well, okay, there's the Turkish occupation of Cyprus, or there's uh, occupation of Morocco and Western Sahara. You know, pick your other situation. They go, well, but they're not the same. And in the end, it's always, they're different. But how are they different? They can't tell you. Some, there's something different about Israel. I wonder I just what can't it is. Tell can, you. You, can, can you put your finger on it? Can't put my finger on it. Can't put a finger. Okay, well, I guess we'll just have to let uh, listeners speculate as to what that might be. Look, we could talk a lot about the problems, the institutional problems of the United Nations. I'm wondering specifically in this war, I want to pick your brains about how you think the United Nations has been acting in this war, where you think it's been placing the emphasis of its political power. And I want to share some impressions of my own as someone who has to go up almost every day and give a press conference and attack the same targets again and again. What has the UN been doing? What has the UN Secretary General been doing? Why has he been lobbying so hard for a ceasefire that would leave Hamas in power? I've gone up in front of the cameras and said, no UN Secretary General in history has ever lobbied so hard to secure the survival of a terrorist organization. Yeah, that is, that is, that is correct. Look, when, when the uh, war began, the invasion by Hamas on October 7th, there were some initial statements of sympathy and condemnation of Hamas by the Secretary General and a handful of other UN officials and bodies. But it was very short-lived. You know, the moment Israel began to even, you know, mildly respond, very quickly the UN reverted back to their default position, which is a pathological condemnation of Israel. One-sided condemnation, and in most cases, if not in all cases, unjustified condemnation. Nothing could be more... Um, uh, respectful of international law, complying with international law, upholding international law, then fighting it back against terrorists and defending uh, against invasion, massacre, mutilation, rape, torture. And I make that point so often, and I'm astonished that others don't understand it, that Israel is doing far more to protect the international rules-based order in fighting against this terrorist army than those that would pressure it to leave it on its feet and validate its human shield strategy by playing along with its vision of hiding in the basement of a hospital in order to render its military assets immune from attack. Absolutely. So, you know, the, the, the UN has their default, which they've had for, say, about 50 years now, which is Israel is always at fault, and any Israeli defensive action is somehow a war crime. And the challenge for the UN is just to find the war crime, and it's always Israel to blame. And indeed, that is the default mode that the UN sank into early on, and if we look at statements, tweets by the Secretary General, it's a uh, consistent failure to hold Hamas to account for their war crimes and a distortion of Israel's justified defensive actions. And indeed, according to several experts, including Colonel Richard Kemp, but others as well, the typical uh, uh, ratio of civilians killed to combatants is about nine to one in urban warfare. And the ratio in that Israel has managed to achieve is about 1.5 to 1, meaning 1.5 uh, civilian casualties to one combatant versus nine civil and civilian casualties as the norm. And if you accept the Hamas figures. If you accept the Hamas, exactly. If you Even the Hamas if you accept figures. the Hamas figures. I mean, one of the things that I think really served as a wake-up call for a lot of especially progressive and liberal people around the world was the 
failure of UN institutions to condemn the Hamas atrocities on October 7th. I mean, what, it took UN women 55 days in order to condemn it. And it just seems that there's this, forget about the political issues, about how this war should end, Israeli victory, put that to one side. A basic lack of sympathy, a basic lack of human empathy towards the Israeli victims of the October 7 massacre. And you see it, for example, with how the Red Cross its social media platforms have been mobilized in order to pressure Israel to suspend this campaign against Hamas, putting a spotlight on the humanitarian issues in Gaza, with only the most perfunctory tweet every once in a while about the hostages. UNICEF as well, constant tweets about the plight of Palestinian children in Gaza, who are really suffering, sure. really suffering from this war that Hamas has invited on them. And I think the one tweet where they put out on uh, Kfir Bibas's first birthday, didn't mention his name, didn't have his photo, as if they've been completely erased from the record. Why, why do you find that these institutions, not the countries themselves, the multilateral, supranational institutions, have this fundamental lack of sympathy or, or empathy towards Israelis? Yes, well, you know, uh, we've found uh, the, same, the same distortions and bias. We counted the Red Cross uh, tweets that give sympathy to the Palestinian situation, which implicitly are condemning Israel, uh, versus sympathy for the Israeli uh, situation, where you have is two hundred thousand displaced, approximately, um, and there were on both the northern border from Hezbollah and the southern border from Hamas. Right. And how many rockets were fired, approximately, against Israelis? I think it's over fourteen thousand at this point. Yeah. So these things are never mentioned. Uh, anyone who's living in Israel now, it's been less rockets than usual, but in the first few months. Millions of Israelis were running to their shelters all the time, and it was really a devastating time, and this was not reflected at all. In the Red Cross tweets, we counted 10 to 1, roughly, uh, against Israel uh, and supporting the Hamas narrative. That does versus, certainly yeah, 10, about 10 to 1. Yeah, it was about 170 to 17, the tweets that we counted. And if you ask why, I would say that the, you know, the UN is a place, and the Red Cross, very similar uh, ecosystems and ideological um, uh, sociological um, worlds that that intersect. The people who come to to the UN may come from a very far left worldview, sort of a Jeremy Corbyn type worldview, where the enemies are America. As bad as that? Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. America is the enemy. Israel's the enemy. Capitalism is the enemy. Colonialism, sort of all together, and Israel somehow really animates them. It's almost theological. It's not a question. It's it's a first principle. If you don't agree that Israel is a vicious occupier in a racist country, you probably will never get hired in these places. And if you would, you might last a day or two. And those who are Jewish and who are proud Jews, who are normal proud Jews and not ashamed, self-hating Jews, are having a very hard time at the United Nations and the Red Cross. And I know it from personal uh, conversations I've had with these people. And these are people who decided to join the UN, which means they're very they pro-UN the people. Filter. They're not right-wing people. They're very progressive people. But what they witnessed on October 7th um, really went, went beyond all of that. So there is a self-selection. And also the UN, uh, certainly we speak about the UN bodies, that you do have this odd dynamic where in order to get, a, like Francesca Albanese, in order for her to get appointed, you had to have a, the majority of member states, a large amount of member states had to like her. Many of them are dictatorships. They're Pakistan, Iran, who hate Israel. And also, she has to be sort of approved by the human rights community, which is sort of Corbinite. So where they converge is if you hate Israel and America, so do, and you're coming from London Human Rights Group, like Amnesty International, and you hate Israel, America, and capitalism, and you apply for the Human Rights Council, well, the Pakistans and the Irans and the Cubas are delighted to appoint someone from a British university who's going to come and do their work attacking America or Israel yes. in the name as a UN human rights expert. So it's because a toxic mix. Because as always, mix. blaming Israel or uh, let's say the quiet part out loud, the Jews, has always been the easiest way for countries to, country societies to deflect blame from their own failures. You know, I'm wondering, I've had these conversations with diplomats as well, where they ask me why some of my social media, for example, will be so hostile to the Red Cross, okay, or other UN institutions that they regard as having this great moral reverence. And I say, look, when these institutions want to run campaigns for issues that they care deeply about, like Gaza's children, they know how to do that. And so their, their silence is really resounding when it comes to the Israeli children still trapped in Hamas captivity. Uh, one of the, uh, the issues I, I'm been concerned about with the UN, specifically with a view to you know, how I'm telling Israel's story and its message, 
has been the cover-up. The cover-up of the way that Hamas has militarized hospitals, built its military facilities in the basements of hospitals, operated out of hospitals, held hostages in hospitals. And I see the tweets by the Director General of the World Health Organization, who will continue to insist hospitals must be protected, accusing Israel of attacking hospitals. Not a single quote, not a single statement condemning Hamas for militarizing hospitals and causing them to lose their protected status in international law, which doesn't give immunity to terrorists just because they're hiding in the basement of a hospital. On the contrary, it gives the conditions in which these protected institutions can lose their protections. And so I say, okay, look, I understand maybe they're not Israel's friends. I understand that in, to some extent they have to do the bidding of the dictatorships that have put them in power. But how difficult is it to condemn a terrorist organization? For waging war out of a hospital, why the cover-up? How do you how do you explain this cover-up? I'd say that, you know there's two factors. One is universal, and one is particular. The universal factor is that the UN will operate in certain uh, crisis zones where the dominant power is a murderous dictatorship. A good example is Syria. We know that UN aid agencies in Syria are subverted. In order to be active and operate with some freedom in Syria, the regime has to buy in to what you're doing. This isn't unique, therefore, the problem we have with UNRWA, for example, in the Gaza Strip, accepting the limitations that Hamas has placed on it and therefore making itself complicit with Hamas's actions. This is a problem with the United Nations in other war zones as well? Right. I'm saying there, there's there's two issues. One one is universal and one is, is extra in particular to the situation with Israel and Gaza. So the universal is, is any UN agency that's operating in Cuba, in North Korea, and Syria, you have to assume that to some degree they are subverted and uh, have been compromised. Otherwise, if, if they would speak out in, with any degree of freedom, they'd be kicked out. And if, they, if the person were moral uh, and principled, they would say, well, I, I refused to be subverted by Pyongyang, and, and that's why they kicked me out. And they said, you're persona non grata. But most UN people, and not to be too cynical about it, they may justify it by saying they need to operate, they need to help people, have to in some ways or, or other satisfy the regime. It means it's being subverted. And there's been a lot written, actually the wife of Ken Roth of Human Rights Watch, um, his wife is Annie Sparrow. She's written several articles, including for Foreign Affairs, sharply criticizing the UN for how they're completely uh, compromised and bribed by the Syrian regime. The same person, Annie Sparrow, has not said a word of how all the UN agencies, famously UNRWA, for the things that you described of having a terror tunnel and a data intelligence center built under the very headquarters and connected That's with the cables. literally the nerve center of Hamas's military intelligence underneath the main UNRWA compound. With cables getting their electricity with cables, from UNRWA. With cables. You know, I, I, I tweeted earlier that the donors to UNRWA should first demand to see the electricity bill from its headquarters in Gaza before thinking of giving them another cent because it simply is not credible to suggest they did not know there was a Hamas server farm in the basement leaching all the electricity you need for those servers. And Israel should get a tip from the donors for having cut off that, that siphoning off. And, and a thank you from the taxpayers. And, I, and a thank you. But so, so, so certainly I would say there is a universal problem, but let's not be naive. The problem in Israel is far worse than that. You know, if, if in Syria, the UN aid workers are somewhat compromised because that's the situation and maybe they don't want to give up their job. When it comes to Gaza, it's a whole, it's a whole nother level. There are people there, someone like Chris Gunnis is a classic example. He was the veteran spokesman. He's been pulled back as a surrogate to be a spokesman for UNRWA. He hates Israel with a passion. And frankly, he's been called out for anti-Semitism. And I don't use that word lightly regarding the UN, but he is someone who would certainly qualify, and Francesca Albanese as well. Why? Let, I mean, let me, let me push back so that doesn't yeah. go without some yeah. criticism. There, there are um, statements that he's made over the years where he, he, he has celebrated. His Twitter account was suspended by Twitter, not under Elon Musk, but under the previous progressive Twitter, suspended his account in 2020 because he celebrated the hanging of collaborators. Those, oh, who, wow. those who were critics of Hamas, he did a whole poem about how their bodies were hanging, celebrating that. Horrific. Yeah, horrific. And and he, he chastised the BBC for writing about Christmas without writing about how the Jews ruined Christmas. And he's really an awful guy. And people can go search my Twitter account and find a, a decade of references to Chris Gunnis and, and his tweets. But um, people, someone like a Chris Gunnis, in my opinion, is um, attracted to work in a place like Gaza the same way that a pedophile might be drawn to work with in a position that offers access to children, like a priest or like a you know daycare center, 
because that gives them access to children. So if you want to spend your whole life condemning the Jews in a way that is socially acceptable, in a way that's virtuous, you show up at UNRWA where you're speaking for the rights of the Palestinians, hmm. and you know that you're actually not caring about the Palestinians because you don't say a word when Hamas tortures them, when Hamas hangs gays, when Lebanon discriminates against Palestinians in UNRWA-related areas, but you only speak out to condemn Israel. Someone like a Chris Gunness, it's way beyond the universal issue that I talked about it. There is a whole coterie of international officials, not all, but there is a coterie who are drawn to work in Gaza because they know their job will be condemning Israel. That's a very disturbing thought because, look, on the one hand, there's the question about how these institutions have to have the buy-in of the local regime in order to do their work. And that's why, you know, UNRWA says it didn't know about the staff members who were Hamas members. Well, the New York Times reported that 10 years ago, when they tried to investigate Hamas members, their legal officer received death threats a funeral bouquet sent to their offices, a live grenade with the pin still inside, and he has to be evacuated for his own safety. So if they didn't know, they need to be honest about why they didn't know, because they were intimidated out and of No one spoke about this for the past 10 years. No one spoke and about no, this. And, and no one spoke this about this. This is the silence talked about. There is a conspiracy. This, this is shocking. You know, you pointed at it, and let's, I think we can develop it, is that it is quite clear that high UN officials, low UN officials, all knew, because there were doctors in Shifa Hospital, who said uh, that we they knew. abducted the host? They abducted the hostages through the front door in front of the security cameras. The idea that no one knew that Hamas was operating out of the Shifa Hospital simply is not credible. You had a doctor saying, "We knew. We were told, don't go there." And and whenever they mentioned something about Hamas, it was in hushed tones. Va and then this vow of silence. This vow of silence. So look, we've got this problem of UNRWA, its headquarters being literally above the Hamas server farm. Everything that's been going on with the UNRWA staff who were Hamas members. The problem of Hamas waging war out of hospitals and the World Health Organization saying absolutely nothing about it. One of the things that has been disturbing me most uh, as the campaign advances inside the Gaza Strip, and I really say this cautiously, there are officials who have blood on their hands, has been the way that the UN has at every turn resisted Israel's efforts to try to get civilians to safety. This war started with the October 7 massacre. We said Hamas terrorists are trying to use civilians as human shields. We need civilians to get out of the way temporarily for their safety so we can go after Hamas. And instead of supporting Israel's efforts to evacuate civilians to safety, they resisted it. They said it was impossible. They said it couldn't be done playing along with Hamas's human shield strategy. Even worse than that, they condemned Israel's efforts to evacuate civilians to safety as forcible displacement. I saw maybe the most absurd statement, Israel designated a safe zone. And then one UN official said that that was a violation of international law to designate a safe zone where we are telling civilians that they're going to be safe. And now with the impending incursion into Rafah as well, the final stronghold, we're saying the UN has a decision to make. Does it want to save Palestinian civilians? Or does it want to try to save Hamas? Because if it continues to insist that it is impossible to evacuate civilians from areas where terrorists are trying to use them as human shields, then unfortunately they're going to be in the way, despite our best efforts, to move them to somewhere they can be protected. And it seems that they're doing this and resisting this in order to continue essentially trying to end this war with Hamas on its feet, still standing in the wake of the October 7 massacre. I mean, I have the whole world telling me I'm mad. So tell me, like, am I mad or is this a fair analysis of the situation? I think it is a fair analysis. And I think it's, it's even, you know, there's two parts to it. One is that they seem to want to preserve Hamas in power. But there's a second part that there is a certain spiel, a certain theater that was that, you know, that took place in the Middle Ages. And maybe we could say it's taking place now. So wait, before we go to Middle Ages and the big picture, I mean, to many people, this will sound absurd and unconscionable that United Nations officials want to keep Hamas in power. I mean, that sounds obviously absurd. How can that be true? Well, I think we need to look at the outcome of one's actions. And very clearly, as you outlined it, the actions of the UN Secretary General and other UN officials and UN entities the outcome of their actions is to keep Hamas in power. And I think, in most cases, let us assume that people are intelligent adults and they know exactly what the outcome of their actions are. 
So calling for a ceasefire immediately now, even while Israel has hostages, including babies, that are being held by Hamas terrorists, when they say ceasefire now, they know the outcome is to keep a murderous state, terrorist state in power. Why they would have that motivation is something that we'll have to leave for others to speculate. Because but they don't say surrender now, which would be the most pain-free way of ending They could ask Hamas to surrender. Yes, exactly. Yes, but they don't. they don't. So let's look at the bigger picture. You were saying something about medieval... Yeah, I just want to... I, I think, you know, one, one outcome of not evacuating is that Israel can't go in because it, it will be too complicated for Israel. Right, they're saying don't attack to... because there are civilians in the way, but civilians can't get out of the way because it's forcible displacement. The logical result being Hamas targets should be immune from attack and should emerge standing after the October 7th massacre. So one, one outcome of, of, this, of this campaign by the UN is to preserve Hamas in power. But there's another possible outcome, which is probably, which is arguably a desired outcome, which is that uh, Israel kills civilian casualties. And I think that you can't understand what's happening now if you don't understand... Desired from whose perspective? Not ours. No, that the UN officials, including their supporters, their allies and groups like Amnesty International and, and maybe some other apologists in the West, want a situation where Israel is killing civilians. That's a very serious allegation. Yes. And, and I think that if we want to understand the Western mind, and maybe the Eastern mind as well, we have to go back. There are things in, in, in the mind that I, I said in the Middle Ages, there would be a certain kind of a theater that was done that was the, the crucifixion of Jesus. And it was something that people would, would in, in, before there was television, they would watch that and the Jew was the guilty one. And it, it would help uh, stir up anti-Semitism when you would watch these, these, uh, these theater um, performances happening. And in, to some extent, I think we can, we can describe the players like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and the Jeremy Corbyns of this world are enjoying a certain theater for them where the Jewish state comes, it is forced into a situation, Hamas fires rockets at, their, at, at Israeli families, Israel is obliged to stop the rockets, but they've hidden their rocket launchers underneath homes, hospitals, schools, and mosques. Deliberately. And unreal places, deliberately. And, and Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and these UN officials know very well that Israel has no choice but to fire back and will kill civilians. Because they and know then, we're not simply going to keel over and die and tell the terrorists to let us have it. Yes, and then there will be this dead Palestinian child. It'll be paraded before the world, before the BBC. And once again, we'll say the Jews killing innocent children, which is an age-old ancient meme that we shouldn't think, we shouldn't be naive in thinking that this isn't in the Western mind that it was for, for generations with the blood libel and things like that. So in my opinion, I think there's, there's a kind of a theater that they want. The same people who said that, who claimed there's a genocide happening in Gaza, that Israel is committing genocide. Outrageously, seriously, falsely. Are the same people who say that not one Palestinian can leave this so-called zone of genocide over my dead body. Would they let a single Palestinian leave this supposed zone of genocide, which is absurd. If, if there were terrible genocide happening in any place in the world, um, the first thing you would say is, let's save them. would be scrambling them. for a right to asylum. Right. But, right. but they don't want that because the Palestinians are pawns in the war against Israel, and they want them there, certain people, in order that they will, there will be casualties. That's, first of all, a very serious allegation, a lot to ruminate on there. One of the things that's also been disturbing me about the way the United Nations has been acting in this war is how Hamas has essentially used it to launder information for global consumption. Now, I'm going on every day giving interviews, press conferences, so I see how this information is getting circulated around the world. Hamas will make a claim, it gives it to UNRWA. UNRWA releases the same claim with a UN stamp on it, even though UNRWA is a Hamas front, it's an organization that is 99% Palestinian and the 1% international leadership buy into it. The next thing we know, that statement is getting quoted at the International Court UN of Justice. Figures. Exactly, UN figures, these are Hamas figures, get passed on to UNRWA. They're then getting quoted at the ICJ. And then you have someone like uh, Francesca Albanese, uh, accusing Israel of violating something the ICJ has told it to do on the basis of the claims that are getting from UNRWA, and then which it come appears, from Hamas. which come from Hamas, and it and appears that we're just confronting judge, jury, and executioner altogether. And Hamas is able to use the United Nations and its moral authority to launder its information, and people keep falling for it. And you're you're quite right. And you mentioned Albanese. It should be noted that the ICJ cited, in addition to UNRWA, they cited a statement by UN experts. And the person who wrote that statement accusing Israel of genocide was Francesca Albanese. There's about 50 UN human rights experts. They communicate together, and she is the one who is pushing them 
and writing these horrific false Orwellian statements. And then the, the same Francesca quoting Albanese, who claims that Israel has no right of self-defense in the wake of the October 7 massacre, uh, and that and this was, wasn't an anti-Semitic massacre And at who all. was condemned for that by at least France and Germany, at I'm least not sure France who else. and Germany, and let's hope for more. Yeah. So, and that actually brings me on to my next And point. I want to say that every other country that voted for her on that day, and I'm going to release the list, it was two years ago, every country that joined consensus has a moral obligation to condemn her now and going forward. There are two problems that I hope we can tackle in order to deal with this problem that we're facing from the United Nations. First is whether it's possible to, to dent its moral authority, the halo that it enjoys in the West that, as you say, these are the men with the long white beards. And the other is whether it is actually possible to reform this institution in a way that makes it live up to the lofty and noble values that were set out in the UN Charter. Do you see a prospect either for serious reform or for making people look at the UN seriously for what it is, if it cannot be reformed? Two good questions. On reform, you know, to some extent, our focus is not on institutional reform, which is extremely hard to do. Security Council is a relic from World War II. Try to change it and give other countries the veto. Well, why would you give it to South Africa and not to Nigeria? Why would you give it to uh, India and not to some other, you know, not to Pakistan? Right. You know, so it's a very big mess. And I think it's very hard to change the Security Council. And much of the UN is very hard to reform. And I don't even think that's the right focus. Let's start with what our democracies are doing. You know, in New York at the General Assembly every year, there is one resolution on Iran, one on Syria, one on North Korea, and 15 against Israel. As I mentioned, most Western countries support two-thirds of the resolutions against Israel, like 10 of them. Yet those same countries, France, Ireland, uh, Italy, have not initiated a single resolution on China, 1.5 billion people uh, denied any form of human rights against Cuba, a police state, Pakistan, where women will have acid thrown on their faces and the regime does nothing. And you go through the list, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, none of these regimes has ever had a UN General Assembly resolution introduced against them by Western countries. So in my opinion, so much more could be done with the existing structure, but with political will, with backbone. And our Western countries need to find the backbone, and that could, it won't necessarily change the UN entirely, but that moral minority voice would be heard, because at the end of the day, we look to what our democracies say and do. Well, let's have a look now at this uh, graphic that we've set up, and I'll use this as another opportunity to plug the show on YouTube so people can watch it instead of having me describe it. Uh, General Assembly resolutions. Let's have a look at the number of condemnations of different countries. We have one for North Korea, two against Russia, one against the United States, one against Iran. And how many against Israel do we have here on the infographic? This says 14. 14. How is that possible? How is it possible that Israel finds itself condemned by the General Assembly more than all other countries put together? And how is it that it doesn't strike other Western democracies as obscene that this is what the World Assembly is doing? I, I don't have an answer for you uh, on why countries could allow that to go along and who go along with it. Again, Western countries, most of them, the, the European countries and the UK typically vote for two thirds of those 14 or 15, uh, depending how one counts, um, each year. And they come up with frivolous justifications saying, well, we don't introduce the resolutions and it's international law. You know, in any other situation, even against a terrible dictatorship, if someone were to bring 14 resolutions against North Korea, they would say, you know, as we say in Hebrew, exempt him. You, you went too far. Over the top. You went too far. We have one, maybe two if there's an ongoing war, like on Russia, there might be a handful. But something that's a protracted situation, to have two resolutions on the Golan, where there's a, a handful of Druze who are allegedly, their human rights being violated, the whole thing is absurd. But even if it were true, to have two resolutions about the Golan Heights, when there's not one resolution for 1.5 billion Chinese people, it's absurd. As always, a way for countries to distract from their own failures and not take responsibility and deflect. I want to show here two uh, of your most viral moments at the United Nations. You've landed a good few punches over your years at UN Watch. It's been how long? 20 years next month. 20 years at UN Watch. Let's have a look at a speech you gave in 2007, the famous band speech. Let's have a look at what you said, and then I want you to tell me what happened after this. I now give the floor to a representative of United Nations Watch. Thank you, Mr. President. Six decades ago, in the aftermath of the Nazi horrors, Eleanor Roosevelt, René Cassin, and other eminent figures 
gathered here on the banks of Lake Geneva to reaffirm the principle of human dignity. They created the Commission on Human Rights. Today we ask, what has become of this noble dream? One might say in Harry Truman's words that this has become a do-nothing, good-for-nothing council, but that would be inaccurate. This council has, after all, done something. It has enacted one resolution after another, condemning one single state, Israel. In eight pronouncements, and there will be three more this session, Hamas and Hezbollah have been granted impunity. The entire rest of the world, millions upon millions of victims in 191 countries, continue to go ignored. Hillel, a speech you remember well, and I know because when we were waiting to go on air, you were lip-syncing the whole speech <laughs> word for word. What happened after this moment? Tell me what the context for this is. This happened, I believe, in March 2007. It was the, right after the creation of the new and improved Human Rights Council. We had the Commission on Human Rights for 60 years, from 1946 to 2006. Founding chair was Eleanor Roosevelt. By 2003, the chair was Colonel Gaddafi's regime, so the rise and fall of human rights. And it was so embarrassing that the head of the UN at the time, Kofi Annan, said, you know, we need to replace this Human Rights Commission and create the new and improved Human Rights Council. They did, June 2006, the new and improved Human Rights Council. Uh, all they did in the first year was condemn Israel. Uh, Gilad Shalit had been kidnapped. They met to condemn Israel. A good reason to condemn Israel, the abduction of an Israeli soldier. The Second Lebanon War began. They condemned Israel. Hezbollah and, attacks against Israel, another good reason to condemn Israel. And the Western countries were actually playing by a different set of rules where... They said, we haven't created the sort of the rule book yet for this new Human Rights Council, so we're not going to bring any resolutions against North Korea or Sudan or what have you. So all they did for the first year was condemn Israel. And I, this is the new and improved. And the chairman, every time he would appear at a cocktail, he was the ambassador of Mexico, was the founding chair of the Human Rights Council, he'd get applause. And we were calling out the absurdity of this new body. And, and I gave this speech. And he, um, actually, if you, look, if you look in the video, he, he folds his arms like this before I begin the speech. And in his memoir, he says that actually he was told by, his, uh, by the bureaucrats, it was presumably Eric Tistounet, who was the uh, top bureaucrat at the Human Rights Council, to stop the speech from before it was given. Because they, they used to ask for me, not others, but for me to give the text in advance, because they were so sort of in fear of what I might say. And they want, he says that he was told to stop the speech in advance, but he was generous and he let me say the speech. But after the speech, he did something that no one had ever done before. The chairman, his or her role is to say, thank you. I now give the floor to the next NGO, Amnesty International, uh, what have you. He's just a, a referee. I ask, I ask you to take the floor, next person. He's not meant to interrupt. Countries could interrupt, but not the chair. He broke this rule. And he said, I will not thank you. For the first time in he Spanish. He said, I will not thank you. For primera vez, for the first time, I will not say thank you. And this is because what you said, you recalled the names of the founders. I mentioned Eleanor Roosevelt and René Cassin. You invoked the names of the founders. You insulted them. I did not insult them. <laughs> and <laughs> You praised them. You insulted the people who were abusing their legacy. That's right. That's right. So he, he took it personally. And, uh, well, maybe I, I wasn't personal, but I was hitting the council. And he ripped into me. And he said that if you ever give this speech again, I will strike it from the records. He banned my speech from ever being delivered again. When it happened, I was in the what back. What did he banned it from being? He said, you, if you ever d d give this speech again, it, I will delete it from the records. So he said, you cannot give this speech again. I, I, I uh, you know, you cannot give this speech again. And Do when you feel like a political dissident? Well, I'll tell you, I was in the room and it was the, the, it's the United Nations. The Human Rights Council looks like, it looks in New York. And he's far away, you know, sitting on the chair. And the whole room is looking at me. It was like a kid when, the, when I was 13 or something, the principal called me out in assembly for talking. And you're embarrassed. It was very embarrassing. But uh, a guy came up to me. His name is Brett Schaefer. And he said to me, he's an American with heritage. And he said to me, Hill, I can't believe what just happened. You know, I was embarrassed because, you know, I didn't even know he was talking to me. You, the seat that I was speaking in, you speak and then you get up and give it to the next guy. So I got up and my intern uh, tapped me on the shoulder and said, Hill, he's talking to you. I said, what do you mean? He's, and I looked and he was saying, you, you. And so um, when I left the room, I realized that suddenly YouTube had begun. It was all new. There wasn't even social media. There was no Twitter. There was no A anything. world away. It was just, but there was YouTube. And I said, well, there's this thing called YouTube. And, and this just started to be videoed, the UN speeches. And I said, the whole year, Iran has been saying these horrific things, denying the Holocaust. Cuba is attacking UN experts who criticize Cuba. And he always says, thank you, thank you, thank you. And we put up that speech, <laughs> that video. And uh, to answer your question, yes, I do. I do feel like a Soviet dissident. Uh, in Moscow, in the you know, an anti-Soviet dissident, an anti-Soviet dissident, an anti-communist Soviet dissident, 
Whereas I'm in an Orwellian world where they will twist the truth, they will shut me down repeatedly, scratch my name off speakers lists, and I'm just trying to speak the truth. Even though you have really been sounding the alarm about deep problems, including about UNRWA and the UN cover-up of the Hamas infiltration of UNRWA, and their response has been largely to disparage, belittle, and defame you as an independent watchdog rather than taking seriously the allegations that you've been raising. From the beginning till today, it's extraordinary that Chris Gunness, again, who, who was the official spokesman, has now been revived as a surrogate. He, just the other day, said, don't listen to UN Watch. I announced that, I, I put on Twitter that I'm going to make an announcement about something, about UNRWA. It was very terse. I said, I'm going to make an announcement about UNRWA. Oh, yes, he wasn't very happy he, about that, was he's, he? He had a meltdown, and he started saying, journalists, don't listen to him. Journalists, this is in the name of Israel and the IDF, and they had nothing to do with my announcement. And I announced that we're having a conference about the future of UNRWA. But he was having a meltdown. And that's exactly what he did in August 2015 when we said there's anti-Semitism being taught by your teachers. He said, don't listen to them. It's a he said, she said story. And of course, over the years, nothing that we said has ever been you know, disproven. Right. And when the UN then says that it takes very seriously allegations against UNRWA, it is, um, as I <laughs> said in one of the press conferences, complete poppycock. Uh, because they've been ignoring you when you... The opposite the is true. Exactly. They, they attacked us. I want to have a look at another clip uh, from another of uh, your speeches. Since you mentioned YouTube, we dug this up on YouTube too. Uh, your famous uh, speech, Where Are Your Jews? Let's watch and then tell me quickly what this was all about. This is from uh, 2017. Today's report does not consider Israelis to be deserving of human rights, consistent with the approach of this council, where today's notorious agenda item against Israel completely ignores their human rights. How many Jews live in your countries? How many Jews lived in Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Morocco? Once upon a time, the Middle East was full of Jews. Algeria had 140,000 Jews. Algeria, where are your Jews? Egypt used to have 75,000 Jews. Where are your Jews? Syria, you had tens of thousands of Jews. Where are your Jews? Iraq, you had over 135,000 Jews. Where are your Jews? Where are our Jews? Well, one of them is over here hosting the State of a Nation uh, podcast. Hello, how do they respond when you ask them, where are your Jews? Complete silence. I would say kind of a stunned look. M most speakers do not challenge countries in that way, but on that day I did. And the background was and that... And more power to you. Thank you. The background was that uh, a very evil UN official who actually spent his adult life defending terrorists named Richard Falk uh, a proponent of the 9-11 conspiracy theory for which he was condemned by Ban Ki-moon for his preposterous remarks. Although that never stopped him being quoted as a respectable UN official or expert. And he had finished his term as UN rapporteur in Palestine, one of the predecessors of Albanese. Uh, so she comes from a long line of eminent... Um, That's good to know she's upholding tradition at least. Eminent supporters of terrorists. He was in retirement, but he was pulled out of retirement by an Arab-led... UN regional agency out of Beirut uh, called, I think it's the Economic um, the Economic and Social Group of Western Asia, something like that. It's basically 18 Arab states, which never included Israel, though regionally they were supposed to. And they commissioned a report about Israeli apartheid. And they asked Richard Falk, a, an American professor, to write the report, which he did. And they published the report, Israel's Committing Apartheid. This is in March 2017. And I'm sitting there listening in the UN agenda item, Human Rights Council agenda item against Israel, one Arab dictatorship, murderous dictatorship, Syria, Libya, you know, uh, pick, pick your dictatorship, and Iran, and they are saying that Israel's committing apartheid. And I heard it, and then, and then the next day I was supposed to speak, and at night I was thinking, I was like, boy, really? These countries are accusing Israel of apartheid? And then I had the thought of that speech. Hell, I want to ask you on a personal note. Where do you find the strength to keep fighting? Do you feel over the last 20 years that you have been screaming into a void? Or do you think you're making a difference? I think I'm making a difference. You know, clearly in some UN fora, there is a void. And the diplomats who hear me, I know they hear me because quietly diplomats from different regions, from Africa, Europe, will come up to me quietly and whisper in my ear, I like your speeches and I listen to you. They're and listening. They're not just hearing you. They're not just hearing Is anything. I'll, sinking in. I'll have UN officials quietly coming out to me and say, "I'm the guy who runs the uh, who runs some of the technical stuff in the room, and I don't listen because there's all day speeches. But when you speak, I listen. So I know that people are listening uh, in the room. But of course, I'm not just speaking to the room. Some of the diplomats have hearts of stone. Not all decisions are made in the capitals. 
I'm speaking to decision makers. I'm also speaking to the wider public. And I do know that our words, you know, some of these speeches have been seen 10 million times. If it's seen a million times, it might be my buddy and his cousin and your friend from synagogue and so forth, maybe a million times. When you reach 10 million, it's a, a, a wider circle. When one of the Green Party politicians in Switzerland came up to me and said, I saw that speech that you did, you know it's going to wider circles than the usual gang. So does it mean it's being listened to? Not every day, but we're standing on the front lines, showing the way for the democracies on what the, on what the bar of decency and morality is. And we, we see ourselves as a lighthouse and we need to be there. I know that our words are quoted in Switzerland in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung. We're in the Wall Street Journal editorial page today. And it's not every day, but we are getting the word out. And you keep fighting the good fight. Hill, finally, before we wrap up, I want to ask you a question. Not one of the questions I've drafted. One of the questions I actually hear from a lot of uh, viewers and listeners who look at all these endemic problems with the United Nations and ask, what is Israel even doing in the UN? Why do we want to be there? If it's all a stitch up, if the whole world is against us, why do we bother? Why don't we just quit the UN? Now I have my answer, but I'm interested in hearing yours. Sure. You know, that's a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a magic bullet. You know, there's the, 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 it seems often that much of the world is against Israel and we'll, we'll just pull out of the UN and so we'll solve that problem. It won't solve the problem. You know, one of my, um, uh, heroes is Abba Iban, one of the great orators of the 20th one of century. One my heroes too. For sure. Him and you. Well, thank you. And uh, we're lucky that we had him as the voice of Israel. And Elon, I could say we're lucky today that we have you as the voice of Israel. So thank congratulations you. for the superb work thank that you. you've been doing. So Abba Iban, he fought so hard to get Israel um, uh, to have the, the resolution of 1947 to vote for a Jewish state. And then for Israel to be admitted in 1949 was a separate vote. They lost one of the votes. But finally, I believe May 1949, they were admitted. And Israel had its place at the, at, at the table of nations. And every country that's worth anything needs to be at the table of nations, which is the UN. So to give that up would actually be a victory for the enemy. The enemy would like right. nothing more than for Israel not to be there. Now, does it pose tremendous challenges? It does, but it's also an opportunity. You know, uh, the UN is a stage. And if we have some of our best spokespersons there, whether it's in Geneva or New York or other UN fora, it is an opportunity for Israel to make its case and the challenge wouldn't go away. Even if you got rid of the UN, you got the ICRC, you got FIFA, the football, the soccer federation who tried to expel Israel. Now apparently Eurovision has some campaign. So any international body can be co-opted by malicious members to gang up on Israel. Should Israel pull out of the soccer federation, out of Eurovision, out of, Definitely every, not. Out of every other international body, it doesn't solve the problem. So I do support from time to time pulling out of, say, the Durban conference of a particular mechanism or not cooperating with the uh, vicious commission of inquiry led by Navi Pillay, which is completely prejudicial and conflict of interest and a kangaroo court. So on certain pointed mechanisms, yes, not to be there, not cooperate, but the UN as a whole, it won't solve the problem. So essentially the United Nations is where Israel claims its place in the family of nations. And just because there are many abusive relatives there doesn't mean we cede our place. In the family, Hill Neuer, CEO of New End Watch. Thank you very much for coming on the State of the Nation podcast. Thank you for podcast. having me. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of today's episode of the State of a Nation podcast. Please subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And we'll be back soon with another episode unpacking the state of our nation. Thanks for joining.